we're so lucky to have you. Um, to those who don't know, this is Sankarshan Murthy. Um, he's the CEO and co-founder of Bumblebee Spaces. Bumblebee Spaces is a company that's extremely innovative and interesting in using AI and robotics to expand the spaces of living. Um, but I'll let Sankarshan describe in a second. Um, first, this entire interview is dedicated to the Dispensaries for Safe Water Initiative. Um, this is by Evidence Actions. They're able to create um, chlorine-based water filters that is able to um, eliminate the, the disease and, and help sanitize the water for drinking. And they're a really cool charity. They're recommended by the Life You Can Save, Peter Singer, and um, check it out and donate if you can. So I'll first start with just letting you describe who you are and what you do. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, and uh, yeah, hello to everyone at, at Warden. Um, yeah, my, my name is Sankarshan Murthy. Uh, I've been uh, in product for since, since I got out of school. Uh, since, so for a long time, I've always been a product person, uh, either in like traditionally started off in engineering role, uh, then became uh, more like traditional product management, you know, like uh, product technology. So I've kind of played different aspects of the product role. Uh, uh, and that's kind of brought me here where I am uh, the co-founder and CEO of uh, what I would describe as a, a deep tech company solving a very traditional problem, uh, which is space. Uh, you know, like no one's building more space. Uh, space is one resource that you cannot just go to a store and buy. Uh, no one's manufacturing more of it. Uh, so we, we've we kind of approached it in a way to what if we could productize space and monetize space in, in a productized way. Uh, so it kind of changes the dynamics from uh, traditional real estate to uh, thinking about home as a product. Uh, so that's that's kind of Bumblebee. Uh, I, I'm happy to talk, talk more about it. Uh, I, uh, I was also like the class of 2012. I was in the uh, the MNT graduate program, uh, uh, EMTM at uh, Wharton and Penn. Uh, it was great, you know, uh, I love Philly. Uh, like, you know, uh, I was in East Coast for a long, long duration before I came out here into in San Francisco. Uh, so yeah, now we're, uh, actually we're pretty close to the Wemba West campus. Uh, our, our headquarters is very like few, few miles away. Amazing. Um, yes. So going into that, um, so you were working at Apple, Tesla, DeWalt, these like large scale companies, and then you transitioned into a startup. So tell us a little bit more about that transition and why. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, I started off um, in like very traditional engineering role. So I went to Univers University of Maryland um, and started working uh, like right after graduating there on uh, kind of like very uh, traditional product development um, through, you know, of like dual uh, product, pro you know, like at the time it was also like, uh, Lit, uh, NICAD batteries were uh, kind of being phased out into lithium ion, which is like a really, uh, at, at the moment, it didn't seem like a key technology driver in the world. But today, because of lithium, it has unlocked so much from like smartphones, like your, all the smart devices, uh, to electric cars, uh, home storage, all that was kind of born from this transition of traditional NICAD batteries into lithium, uh, lithium, lithium phosphate, lithium oxide, and various uh, technology there. So I worked on like traditional product development back in uh, like when in dual, like working on all the lithium ion uh, uh, cordless power tools. After that, I was there for a quite, quite a bit uh, of duration. I was there for almost five years. It was like really interesting, like being in large company where their approach to uh, 
even though they hire, um, even though they're a large company, they hire very few people and they give like a very, uh, very good onboarding process and really impressed. Like even today, I use a lot of like the things I learned at Duvault, uh like that, you know, in, in my day-to-day -day work. Uh, so they, like I learned a lot there going through like full stack of product development, engineering, uh, manufacturing, operations, operations, like completely it's full stack at Black & Decker. It's really interesting how, uh, how that was working. Um, kind of that, that helped me kind of prepare for my next gig at Apple. So uh, right after Wharton, I uh, joined Apple. In fact, I hadn't yet graduated. Um, my, I was in the last term there uh, when I moved to Apple. At Apple, like the first uh, seven to eight months, I was doing like one thing, which is like buying lasers. Uh, all over the world. It was like a really different role. Uh, I was working on like very, like, you know, it's like from working on like large products end to end to just working on making laser mark on iPhone 5, iPhone, uh, iPod mini, iPad mini, you know, like it was just like a very niche thing that I was put on. But the impact to the business was so massive because I ended up, Within the first seven eight months of working at Apple, the POs I was writing, like buying these lasers all over the world, was more than most Fortune 500 CEOs would see in their life. You know, it's like huge amounts of cash. That the, the impact of the business you can have is so massive at Apple because of the scale of their operation is, it's it's like, uh, you know, it's like cities versus like small companies, right? Mm -hmm. so it's like massive. Were you sourcing the laser or were you helping to? Yeah, the kind of combination. It's like one, there's like a product development aspect of it, uh, making sure all the requirements from industrial design is met. And then second, like sourcing, optimizing, um, optimizing for cycle times, getting like the, like, uh, getting the supplier, the contract manufacturers to uh, actually own it and run it. And like, you know, the, the basically it was like a, whole exercise in delayed customization, which is like really interesting uh, aspect of the uh, operations there. Uh, and then, yeah. you know, at Apple, I got pulled into this secret team, like the whole building. It was just like, that was like a whole beginning of Apple, like, you know, how like, like a complete rebirth of, uh, of my career at Apple, where it was like, you know, moving into the watch role, like completely changed the way I, I like, uh, you know, my experience with Apple the first few months was completely different. And like, like next three years at Apple, just like watch that was, it was kind of like skunk work, small team, like doing 60 different products at the same time. Uh, and like much more high touch. It was, it was like chaos, but it was also like, uh, like that choreography leading up to the launch was, uh, it was immensely satisfying. Uh, and then I actually followed my boss from Apple to Tesla uh, and kind of had a Tesla operates much more like a, a smaller company than, uh, than Apple or other much more chaotic, much more intense uh, signing up for Tesla feels like you're signing, signing up for special forces. And I was also working on special projects there. So it's a very intense gig. Uh, and it was like fun. In fact, I would have continued working at Tesla if it hadn't been for Bumblebee. So Bumblebee started off as like a bootstrapping exercise because, it, you know, like in any time, like I've worked on products, uh, it, there's always been clash for space. Uh, the, either the battery team wants another millimeters more or the uh, LED team wants another few, uh, you know, like micrometers more. Everyone's fighting for like, such a uh, minuscule amount of space, but really where are you paying for space is like your home, like you're, every month you're paying for mortgage, rent, taxes, insurance, that's where most of your money goes. And no one's really arguing about optimizing for space there, right? And that's where it started. Like I, I was started off as an argument with my wife, like, hey, we need to use this space a lot better than uh, have more space. Uh, especially when you're paying a lot for space, you end up like understanding how how important that what that dimension is to optimize. 
and uh, started off as like a side project, like a Mickey Mouse clubhouse in my garage. And uh, very soon realized this is the problem of our lifetime to solve um, more than any, you know, compute or more than any like uh, product related like problem. You need to solve like where is most of our resources going uh, and how to make most efficient use of that. Um, and it also like, you know, there's a very like mission driven approach to Bumblebee. And that, that, that really drove the, like, why we kind of dedicated our lives to doing this. Wait, so paint us a picture of what a day with an entire suite of Bumblebee Spaces products would, would be like. You wake up, you have uh, your, your table come down. Oh, explain to us what, what that process would be like. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I wish I was at my showroom uh, or uh, workshop. Uh, we have a showroom which kind of paints this full 3D picture, but yeah, happy to like kind of send you guys a link of it. Um, but, you know, when you think about home, everything's uh, static. Uh, and what you don't understand is, you know, let's say a table, you need access space, you need chairs, you need like access to get in, get out. You, you place a bed, you need like access to get in, get out. Anything you place is static and you need access all around it. Um, and literally every time you add a function to your home, you're not just adding the cost of the function. So, you know, if I want to add a nightstand, a dining table, whatever, uh, you're not just, it's not the cost of $200 dining table that you're adding. You're literally occupying, if it is a 20 square foot table, you're occupying 20 square foot at the cost of San Francisco real estate, which could be $1,500, $2,000 per square foot, depending on the neighborhood. So you're occupying footprint and access space for every function you add. Uh, and that's traditionally how houses are built. If you look at a house from, from 1700s, 1600s, like the earliest uh, you know, Mesopotamia civilization when they dig up, it's the same floor plan the living room, the bedroom, maybe the, sometimes the bathrooms were outside, sometimes were inside. Like, it's like every house was like laid out the same way and we haven't really innovated much in that space. Uh, and as you think about where resources are going, like, you know, so over the next, over the next uh, few years, we're gonna be, build, like next 40 years really, we're gonna be building one New York City a month of housing for the next 40 years. Wow. So every month we're going to add like close to a million houses onto the planet. Uh, and we we'll essentially double the number of houses on the planet uh, over the next 40 years. That's a ridiculous amount of uh, space that's occupied, the amount of uh, kind of suburban, uh, you know, like, uh, dis uh, you know, like dissipation of the surface area of the planet that we take on, uh, the amount of... Um, uh, you know, like uh, the carbon footprint, the heating, cooling resources, uh, building materials, all that you add. And all that is like really not being used well. Like, so mm -hmm. if you could, what we do at Bumblebee is essentially unlock this third dimension using what is traditionally, be, uh, traditionally completely unused, which is your ceiling space. So we put these fixtures and furniture all the way in the ceiling beds, storage, access stuff like closets, uh, luggage racks, anything that in the home that's traditionally just taking up footprint and not being used all the time, desks, um, dining, de dining tables, everything. And they come down when you need it. And when you need it, you want 100% of that function, right? Like when you want to sleep, you want a great king bed. When you want to eat, you want a great dining table. When you're working, you want a great desk but you don't need it down all the time all you know uh, and you don't want to be using up all the resources all the time so we make it and you essentially when you're working you're not sleeping when you're getting ready you're not working so you you can stagger these functions very um, kind of almost thoughtfully based on uh, how users use it and only bring it down when you need it disappears when you don't and rest of the time it's just a just a poetic home with open space and no clutter. Uh, and kind of powering this is a really powerful software that 
thematically understands what you want based on duration of the time, based on a lot of like sensors that understand what you're storing, uh, what you're retrieving, what you're using, what you're not using. Turns out we, anybody in like, I can go through your inventory and kind of like show you a long tail of things that you essentially don't use. Like, oh, you have this tennis racket, you haven't played tennis in a couple of years, get rid of it. You can, you, once you become aware of the, your, the inventory that you sit on all the time and not really using it, uh, it's enlightening on um, how you think about, think about, so there's the stuff and the space that kind of like this intermingled problem and you kind of solve them together. Let's see, so you're bringing AI combined with Mary Kondo's strategy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the way we kind of like you say, it's Marie Kondo in your ceiling if like she's, she's constantly uh, kind of fine tuning your inventory, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, we're like big fans of Marie Kondo. <laughs> and so going back a little bit in your history, so you, were, you learned about batteries when you were at DeWalt, and then you learned about lasers and sourcing when you were at Apple, and then you, you learned about another set of skills at Tesla. So do you think all of those were necessary components and building blocks for you to start your own company, or do you think you could have done this right after Wharton? Uh, so my entrepreneurial spirit kind of like existed uh, even before, like even during school days, you know, just this has been, uh, I've always been a big, believer in starting uh, um, starting something you know and it, it, i've started like small businesses in the past without really good good understanding of without good business sense right like for example uh when when i was in india i used to run uh, a kind of a computer assembly i used to buy motherboards and graphics processors and RAM and all this from different component vendors, like kind of like CompUSA, like buy it all over and then like assemble it and, you know, put uh, Windows on it and Microsoft Word on it and sell like assembled computers, like kind of like this early version of Dell of, you know, and I used to have such terrible business sense. I used to turn down customers almost on a, if not daily, like weekly basis, I used to turn down customers Mm -hmm. instead of scaling the business. I like, there was so much demand during these, like it was like 2000s, right? Like everyone wanted a computer and just like, it was also like constant refresh from Pentium 2, Pentium 3, like constantly like uh, generations of computer coming up. It, It was just like, didn't really convert it into like a big business. Could, could have like very, like very simply, the thing I learned uh, from large companies, large companies show inefficiency in how they do, how they run business. You'll see a lot of like internal energy of a lot of people. Uh, You'll meet like really sharp people, like especially Apple. Apple's full of like these extremely sharp type A uh, folks who each one can be a CEO and easily like crush like the market that they're going to enter. Except they're kind of at Apple just doing like a button or a laser mark or whatever, like just doing one thing. Right. And uh, so a big part of my team is from Apple uh, because you, you show these folks like you don't have to be stuck in that stuck in like these like microscope like working on like minutia of the problem and you can come and like like have a put a ding in the world like they they I mean, they join apple to put a ding in the universe uh but really that gets tempered by the day-to-day reality of what really happens and you don't you know as a big as a being in a big company you're the way i say it you're like a an officer in the navy you you'll be very disciplined. You can run it. Like you can see how, like how beautiful the ship is, all that stuff. But being in a startup is like being a pirate. Like you are running the ship every, it's a, this chaos there. Oh, it's like millennium Falcon versus, uh, you know, this big spaceship. Uh, so it's like, it's puttering. It's like, there's lots of like chaos, but it's also, you learn the, the, the amount, the feedback is immediate. The, market tells you right away the customer tells you right away there's no 
there's no air gap in like the strategy the CEO develops to the engineer working on the line or the uh, or the operations person or our business development folks like everyone's like you know we are like a family kind of like working through this and that kind of that that drives a little bit of like a chip on the shoulder to like we're gonna prove these big guys wrong right so there's definitely that and so, uh, so, but so you, you know the amount of learning that that i got from apple tesla and connections like unparalleled i i, I could i have started bumblebee before all this probably but i would have had to make a lot of mistakes to learn you know it's very difficult mm-hmm. um, and uh, like definitely you want to short circuit as much as you can when you're uh, doing a startup i see and on the side of pirates so if bumblebee bumblebee is a pirate then who is the big boats that you're trying to steal from like what is the market what is the customer you're trying to steal or which company are you going after yeah it, it's interesting i mean the way the traditional market that we go after are like not uh, not tech competitors uh, right it's like traditional real estate mm-hmm. guys doing traditional bedrooms kitchen cabinets closets you know uh, it's a very fragmented world um, and real estate you know people talk about money in tech but every multi family apartment or condo that's developed uh and then once you're done developing and then you either hand off or you like you start operating it's like an exit from a big startup uh those guys make a lot of money there's lots of money and that is it's uh it's uh, that world is built on leverage the whole real estate world runs on leverage heavily um it's uh um so it's really what you're uh kind of like swimming against is status quo of people doing the same right and and that's it's a, it's a big challenge to swim against that uh especially as an innovative product the question for us is never show me like the math of efficiency of adding these functions into it's never like metrics driven question they come in they're like whoa who wants to live like this right like initially it was like our design was very techy like very like uh, everything's exposed we ship too soon like it was like it's just like you know like chaos but now when they come in they're like oh my god this is 2020 like walking into a like an apartment this this is like 2020s apartment versus you go into any other apartment feels like 1900s you know just like totally changes the way you think about homes um so for us like seeing the seeing is believing in the product so that is very which makes it challenging to like you know we're not like an app where a lot of folks can download and experience it immediately you have to walk people through in fact like video also doesn't quite do justice in so many ways because no one's like looking at the ceiling at all ceilings this true truly invisible space so when you're in the in the bumblebee home all you'll feel is kind of feel is kind of this openness open space and then the home kind of changes around your life so it's kind of it's truly like a poetic transformation from one beautiful space to another beautiful space that's so interesting so one thing you said was when you're a pirate you're not only facing against other larger boats but you're also facing against the entire ocean like that that can also be your enemy as well so that's a very interesting perspective right um <laughs> and so during this process um there must have been a very very low period and um what was that and how how did you overcome it yeah i mean uh i think so there you know like startups roller coaster um there are it, the way i kind of described to my wife uh, you know you're like having two emotions in general like it's either panic or like excitement like like you you're like holy shit like this is like not going to work or holy shit this is working like it's just like two like extreme and uh and it's it's hard to be in that fight or flight mode for like prolonged duration and uh 
that was kind of um, uh, that that is that is a struggle that um, you know that's what Elon talks about chewing glass right like you you'll take it on because of all these like thrilling moments and though and normally you tend to remember uh, like these those moments and then also like you know some of the struggles seems like oh that was like a nightmare we dealt with at the time like now like almost kind of like you're over it um, and you and sometimes you live through it like you, it's horrible like you know, there's like lots of uh, challenges like that uh, but uh, yeah I think like some of the obvious ones for us um, were during this initial period uh, are we you know like the question's always this chicken and egg um, who wants to buy this and and then as a large hardware product, you want to, you, you don't want to ship so early that it's like, kind of like, uh, not, not that you're just embarrassed by it. It's almost like a, it becomes like you, you're now anchored with this, uh, like kind of like really bad install or, or something like that. So finding that balance was initially tough. Like, and also we like, you know, we're outsiders to this real estate industry. None of us came from real estate. Now we have like a couple people in the team who traditionally have worked with developers and such. Initially, they were not even like my second level contacts on LinkedIn. And they're like, they're so uh, well to do, like people who build like good homes, uh, like at scale, they're so well to do. They don't care about LinkedIn. They don't, they, they don't network. They have their own circle. They do what they do and they make money out of it. So it's very difficult to kind of like break into that space and say, you need to change because you guys are optimizing your home wrong or, you know, like it's, there's not enough of a compelling uh, pitch for them. So that was, that, that was one of the tough ones initially to make these, uh, get like these early adopters to believe in the product, believe and. Like, so it started off as like an experimental thing for them. They're like, hmm, this is crazy. Let's try it in a studio over here. Let's try a one bedroom. You know, it's like, so that's kind of how it started. Mm -hmm. um, but eventually we started, you know, like prove every time we do an install, we're like, this is like, it's kind of going viral, you know, mm -hmm. those moments. Um, yeah, and uh, fundraising too. It's like same question. Like people are, who wants to live like this? Who is paying for, you know, like there's a lot of those challenges. So you learn to get like kind of thick skin, like hearing no should not, uh, like you should not take it personally and such, but it's, it is hard. It is like, did he say no because of me? Like, you know, like you, you never know. Like you never know for sure. But, you know, so... Those are, those are tough things because they're, they're, they, you know, like the common VC answer to not investing, uh, you guys are a bit too early for us. You know, that's like a very common answer. Uh, and it's hard to like decipher what that means, right? Uh, you guys are a bit too early. Like, okay, so do you, what do you want to see? Like, it's like kind of like, it's, it, uh, so th those are, those are some of the struggles uh, and you know, like also uh, it's not like, it's not like the struggles are done, right? We can't, it's like a roller coaster. You like go up and down and up and down. So it's always interesting. Yes, uh, I completely understand. And I think too early is, it's, you never know, it's either too early or too late or, or something in between. Um, but what do you think like was the secret of getting the, initial team together like the apple employees to like give up their right. lucrative jobs to come to you yeah uh, so uh, you know so like our team is mostly friends like the initial team is like directly like i work with them like we've done like some crazy hard projects together my co-founder is actually we went to warden together um, so it, you have this level of camaraderie and you just like, uh, you trust each other to a point where, uh, that, that kind of opens up a level of, okay, so this, that, that can work. Second, 
it's really what we're what I pitch to folks like who join us. Uh, you, you know, like obviously Silicon Valley, like you can't compete with, like you, you and and if we start com- competing with like offers uh, of like salary and stocks and like op- you know all this stuff, like it's you end up. Uh, like kind of like justifying numbers like it, that that will never work but i think a few key things that really move the needle on like amazing folks joining on one is it's like such a mission driven work and you come to if you come to bumblebee you'll see like we kind of live it uh we you know like we we truly believe in like how do we leave the planet better in a smaller footprint, right? We're, like truly there's like the ripple effects of making Bumblebee scale, it, the, the massive impact you can have on cities and, and sprawl and like flora and fauna is so massive that really talks to our team. Like it's really like people really uh, live and breathe it in our, in our shop, right? It's, um, to a point where, you know, like, it's not like, like we're living, like, it's not like we're living, like the planet belongs to us. In fact, like, how do we read you? How do we build less? Like we belong to the planet. We kind of flip it around and think through that. I think the mission is, I would say like our key uh, driver. And second, this culture of being in control of what we're doing, like directly, like this is where like, kind of not being an officer in the Navy and just like doing one thing you're told versus coming and really having an impact deep on the company's roadmap, company's direction. Uh, And, you know, there's, it's really like, it's the people who make it and it's all like filled with really smart, humble folks. And, you know, any, any group of folks I go to at Bumblebee, uh, definitely my level of knowledge will be among the lowest among like they they bring it up they pull they push the team much ahead uh and that that really matters so yeah i think uh, so we really truly live and breathe that i see um so yes i think that concludes the first section of the interview um and for everybody joining we're talking to some question murphy um about bumblebee spaces and um, his journey into entrepreneurship and the future of living in general. Um, so feel free to post questions into the Q&A section or within the Facebook Live, and um, we'll try to answer as many as possible. But we have a few questions, and actually the first question comes from um, someone you might know. Uh, it's from Adam Grant, and Adam Grant um, submitted two questions. The first one is, what is your favorite insight about personality? F- favorite what? Favorite insight about personality. Oh, I, I love Adam Grant. He's an investor in Bumblebee also and an advisor. Uh, being, uh, you know, I think the thing about uh, being, uh, uh, being, uh, 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 being kind of uh, perceived as lazy, uh, being... Uh, you know, delaying your uh, deadlines. Uh, I, and that really like talks to me. I do that a lot. I, I pri- like I, at any given point, you'll see like I deprioritize things that, that are like, you know, I, I still don't have all the information on and like deprioritize. So this procrastination approach to uh, creativity, uh, where he talks about in his TED talk also, uh, I, I'm a big fan, uh, like big fan of Adam Grant and uh, yeah, like really grateful. He is one of the early backers of Bumblebee uh, and he's been a friend of the company since. Just a small question on that. How did you find these early back, uh, backers? Like Gene Munster is also one person who I know is very important. Yeah, to. Gene is also another like, so like folks, uh, you know, who are like very culture centered, like Adam and uh, Gene, Gene, it's funny, like, uh, whenever I have questions with a lot of investors, uh, discussions, I'm like, hey, here's like business update, his team update, his product update is like all the new tech we're working on. Here's like 
the new customers in the pipeline. Like I'm, I'm he's like, hey, hey, how are you? Like mm-hmm. just like changes the topic. And Gene is, uh, yeah, he uh, all he cares about is how the core founding team is handling their uh, mm-hmm. handling their kind of like day to day pressure of all the sites, right? And uh, that really like it it gives you a level of this is the type of investors you want, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, really grateful for Gene and Adam to be part, kind of part of our uh, portfolio of investors. And to those who don't know, Gene Munster is the partner at Loop Ventures and is a very, very um, vocal a- analyst on Apple and big tech stocks. Um, but okay, the second question from Adam Grant is, if you could gift the Bumblebee space equipment to any person in the world who would you give it to oh god uh that's a tough one um so you know so we've had a lot of people who ask for like these pilots like oh let me try one i'm a large developer i have thousands of apartments give me one let me try it and we always say no there's no free lunch for you man like because you you're a rich guy like you're gonna pay for this like no uh, but we've seen that it changes uh, quality of life to like people living in urban areas, especially uh, young family. Uh, so, you know, like you're a young parent and you're living in like a one bedroom and whoever has a kid knows that the bedroom becomes a nursery and like there's no place to live. And that's also when you have most visitors. So we've seen that whenever you put Bumblebee in a young parents' home, it changes their life so radically. Uh, they can still host, they can still have, and, and yet they get a whole room whenever on demand. And uh, so we would definitely, if we were gifting, like we would gift it to folks who are strapped for space like that. Mm, I see. That's... So, so more of a group of people, less so one person. Yeah, less of one specific person, but yeah, that that is the, uh, I would say that's the demographic that feels the pinch of space and money um, the most. Uh, urban young parents. I see. Yes. Um, the next question comes from George Yang, um, who's a senior at Wharton, and the question is: Are there any safety hazards with lowering an entire bed down? Um, and what about long-term maintenance of these ropes and pulleys? Yeah, I mean, that, that's like one of our top questions. So, you know, we do a lot of uh, uh, redundancy in, in our like systems. Um, and this is where a lot of uh, time and effort has gone. And the reason we're not in like hundreds of homes yet is because of like the amount of diligence each deployment takes and how uh, how careful we are with all the all the system uh, kind of the factors of safety and such. Uh, so essentially, w- what we do is we distribute the load across the whole ceiling using kind of a modular install method that we've kind of uh, come up with. And uh, what that does is per square foot, it adds like around 30 or like less than 30 pounds, like sometimes it's 18 pounds of very low light per, per square foot, which is um, uh, like well within what is considered as a live load uh, design. So it's like these, there are like already a bunch of building codes uh, and requirements around what you can hang on the ceiling and what kind of load you can put on it. So one, we kind of stay well within that uh, border uh, within that region. Next, um, all our systems are kind of engineered for like, like almost infinite life within the operating cycle. And when you overload it and when you like do things that are like outside of the norm, uh, we design for like soft failure. So, you know, like if you overload it, it gives up, it doesn't catastrophically fail. If you overuse it, we can see sensors trending in the wrong direction or whatever, you know, those are, we track it, uh, we track the analytics, we do, we don't have to, like, it's like maintaining a Tesla in a way, we can do a lot of over the air updates, we can follow each sensor's behavior remotely. Uh, And that also gives us an opportunity to kind of 
make it more autonomous um, over the period of your life. So, you know, as uh, you can imagine, in, you know, it's night, you get up in the morning, go to the bathroom, come out, it's changed into a closet. It's like changed itself without you hitting any buttons. So to do such things, you have to gain like more and more confidence over, over a period of duration. And that's kind of like a lot of like our work uh, is focused on that. And there's already building standards because if we look at our garage, a lot of times the garage goes above the ceiling. So is there like a mix of policies that are similar? Yeah. So, there, I mean, there's a combination of things. You know, there is, um, this falls under what is called as the FFNE, fixture furniture and equipment, like similar to light fixturing and things you put on the, in the ceiling. And even uh, things around, if you go into anchors, into concrete, what kind of anchors you should select for what kind of loads um, and our system works like an appliance so you only take one outlet you don't have to do wiring and uh, so there's a lot of innovation that's gone into uh, basically like installing it into built environment uh, and then the next portion of it is all kind of the interaction pieces and how how you interact with it uh, so there's like layers of kind of redundancy built into uh, either both of those systems got it and um the next question is from ann is um how did you come up with your name bumblebee spaces yeah uh actually yeah like my wife came up with the name um so there's like a story behind this uh and so you know i um initially the whole thing was uh you know driven by this kind of like Mickey Mouse Clubhouse, it's a robotic home, just changes around your life. Uh, but uh, it was inspired by, you know, the Transformer Bumblebee. Uh, so, and then also bees are very efficient in the use of space and how they are, uh, you know, bees play a very interesting role in the ecosystem. So uh, it, it was fitting to have an organic name. Uh, so yeah, we took it. <laughs> I love that name. I, I, when I was researching, I realized that when I was running down the roads and realized there was a bumblebee like car. Anyways, um, what, what is your biggest obstacle right now? Yeah, so yeah, our biggest obstacle, you know, like we talk about kind of this crossing the chasm from, uh, it's always uh, inter- because there's this kind of like, whoa, cool factor, novelty, you know, like this, oh, let's try a few studios, let's try a few bedrooms, like, you know, those, like going from that to people architecting the homes around like this third dimension, there's, there's a leap you have to take, right? So there, and some customers are more ready to leap into that than others. Uh, and kind of finding that right set of partners and right set of like believers that that's definitely where our a lot of my energy and time uh, is spent um, it, that and the product like those are kind of like two like main areas like because we're building the product and the market in a way like we we're like so the the market exists in in some ways but we're also don't we don't compete with traditional murphy beds or something right we we go after folks who are building much more thought, thoughtfully designed homes uh, and we add to it. Uh, and why would you build traditional closets and doors and closets and uh, cabinets and all this stuff when you can just do Bumblebee? So kind of like taking that leap to like, then there's like a design integration work that needs to happen, uh, which, which is kind of neat. It, it's also a fun thing to work on, but it's also uh, there's a like there's a sales cycle of it can take longer, and it can be um, it, it takes more time to realize this fully purpose built bumblebee versus now we are doing much more retrofit. We just like go in, pop, 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 and like install it. So kind of doing a combination of things there um, and like go to market strategy. Amazing, um, and thank you so much. I think that's. Um, close to the end of the entire broadcast and interview. Um, thank you so much. Just a quick reminder that this entire interview was dedicated to the Dispenser for Safe Water Initiative by Evidence Action. And make sure to donate if you can. They are trying to help sanitize the water supply for millions of people in rural countries. And 
Also, um, for the final question, Sankarshan, what is your advice for undergraduates going into their working life or, or during this pandemic? What is your advice to them? Yeah, you know, it's also, yeah, it's, inter it's crazy time. It's also a heavy time in the world, right? Like there's lots going on um, with, uh, with social justice, with pandemic. Uh, it's been, uh, it, it's like so much uh, being in college. Uh, also, you can, like, I think physical classes are also paused. You know, it's, it's a very uh, weird thing that we, I, I don't think anyone saw this coming. And I also like don't know how the, uh, like the ripple effects of the economy is going to be past this. Uh, so th there's lots of uncertainty. But I, you know, I think the few things I took away when, when I was, you know, when, when I was at Warden, I think the thing that I learned most that I'm really grateful for, uh, as an engineer, like very uh, kind of, I would say like idealistic, like very like, this is how it needs to be done. I, I would challenge a lot of things. Uh, I think I learned a lot of tact uh, and in how to deal with people uh, when I was at Wharton. I think that's a very interesting area to focus on. That's where I think Adam Grant's guidance will be so interesting to understand how how to build, because mo like most of the work, like you'll realize like when you're working entrepreneur, what, like working with founders, VCs, whatever, it, the, most of the work is like people to people. It's like human problems, like interaction and stuff. So getting good at like persuasion and negotiation in a way that, uh, that sets you up for long-term success, not for like near-term negotiation, right? like look for long-term success, definitely focus on that. Um, I think, you know, I, I, I would like also like be skeptical, uh, be curious and skeptical about any, don't jump to conclusions, you know, um, because it's like most of the work, uh, you know, like I, I always say to my team uh, to, every time we're debating something about either retrospective of what could be done better, what should have been done, would have like, this would have been different. Like I, almost like, you know, like let's like eliminate this um, like debate around the past. I know there's lessons to be learned and our brain kind of processes it as needed, but really everyone like in my team, I tell them you should be a futurist. You like in a way that it, I know it like that, the word futurist makes it sound like a loaded word, like, oh, you're predicting the future. But really, like, you should be trying to predict the future. That's where you should be spending a lot of your mental energy, debating, understanding. And you'll see you'll be wrong about quite a few things about the future. And then you'll be right about a few things. And you, it, it builds your muscle of how to predict the future better. The more things you're wrong and you, like, kind of like calibrate yourself that, okay, yeah, I guess economy and pandemic, like they react like this. It, it, it may be like a one-time data point, but you'll start getting this kind of like a spidey sense of how to predict the future really well. And that, I mean, that's what we're all trying to do, like how to navigate, like, you know, if you can get an edge into the future, like then like build leverage and like manipulate that, right? But, uh, but whenever we discuss with folks, we're mostly talking about the past. Like, what does it matter talking about 2016 election when you have no way to like, you don't have a time machine to fix that. Well, of what we can do is kind of like talk about the future that's kind of in our control and see where we're wrong, where we're right. You know, I think that'll be an interesting, so yeah, be a futurist. That's kind of my advice. <laughs> wow, amazing. So be a futurist and also be skeptical. Thank you.